right, so I am here today with one of, um, basically one of the favorite backyard um, garden subjects, like Persicon esculentum, um, the garden tomato. And this right here is a variety called Matt's Wild Cherry. And I don't know if it's true, it's probably not true actual what we would call wild type or wild form, but it's about as close as you can get. Um, this is kind of what a... A uh, natural tomato might look like, although some of them may not actually be red. They might be a little bit more greenish or yellow. Um, but this is kind of, if you were to find a wild tomato, um, probably in, you know, Central America, this is what they look like. And this is what the wild tomato flower looks like. So notice we've got five petals. And on the back, we've got five sepals. So these yellow things right here these are the anthers and what always used to confuse me as a kid is if you look at them there's no dusty stuff on them so the interesting thing about them is on the inside they actually hold their pollen on the inside and the only way they can be pollinated is kind of by vibration so these are actually buzz pollinated so bumblebees will come and they'll actually latch onto these they'll vibrate and the pollen actually drops out. It's usually invisible, um, but even just vibrating it actually with an electric toothbrush will, will simulate that. Um, honeybees don't do vibration though, so they're um, kind of useless as far as tomato pollinators. So if you're trying to use your honeybees to pollinate your tomatoes, um, it's not going to work. And that's because tomatoes evolved in the New World, and honeybees are not native to the New World, so honeybees and tomatoes did not uh, evolve together. So commercial tomato growers will actually use um, colonies of bumblebees when they're growing tomatoes in a uh, like a greenhouse situation. Anyway, <clears throat> so this gets pollinated underneath. If it gets pollinated, you'll get the ovary right here. So notice you can kind of see this little hair-like thing. That's actually the stigma and the style that's broken off you can see there's kind of a little dot there so this is a superior ovary and this guy is of course what will become the tomato okay so over here we have the flower of this is a hybrid tomato now you may notice you say well, wow that's got a lot more petals it seems to have a lot more stamens the stigma is kind of all mutated looking and that's true basically people human beings have selected essentially mutant plants that have extra parts so that they can make these giant, ridiculous sized tomatoes that uh, so many of us know and love. Um, but that's basically, that's not, that's not natural. A natural tomato is what I just showed you, the uh, cherry tomato. And basically what they have is they have lots of extra lobes in their ovaries. And that's what gives them this really crazy tomato structure. The nice thing about tomatoes is being members of the Solanaceae, the nightshade family, um, they produce lots of nasty chemicals in their leaves. And because of that, there's not very many organisms that can eat them. Um, one of the famous ones is the tomato hornworm moth. And basically, as long as you can find them, you can just pull them off of your plants. Um, but they're usually not super damaging. And that's another reason why tomatoes are such a fantastic crop to grow, because you basically don't really have to spray them very much. There are some diseases they can get. There's early blights and late blights and spots. Um, but if you choose the right varieties, usually they're fairly resistant, um, and you can still get a pretty good crop out of them. So next, we're going to cu cut open some of these tomatoes and take a look at um, the locules on the inside. Right, so right here, we've got, of course, the standard garden tomato. Notice it's got a lot of sepals. Some of them are kind of fused together versus this cherry tomato, which again is closer to a wild tomato, which pretty much always has five sepals on the end. Now when we cut them open, notice here, here's our standard garden tomato. We've kind of got the one, two, three, four, five, six, who knows how many locules there actually are there. Can't even really count them properly because they're all kind of fused together. And that's what makes, of course, a nice, beautiful beefsteak tomato that we're used to. But um, it's not 
natural. However, over here, we've got a cherry tomato. And cherry tomatoes basically have two locules. A little bit harder to see on this one. Let's see if I can get this guy right here. Okay, so this one's perfect. So right here, look at this cherry tomato. So right here, that's the placenta right there. There's a placenta there, and there's a placenta there. So those are where the seeds are attached. So it has two locules, one, two, and that's it, just those two locules. That's the wild type. That's the natural situation for pretty much all members of the Solanaceae. Now there's just some exceptions, but this is mo the most common situation. So notice we've got a bunch of seeds here. We've got seeds on this side. And a tomato is the kind of fruit it's called, this is an actual, a true berry. So most of the things that we think of as berries are not berries, but tomatoes are actually berries. We say, well, isn't the tomato a vegetable? Vegetable doesn't really have a botanical definition. It's sort of things that people eat that are, I don't know, come from plants. It's, really, <laughs> it's kind of like, could be any particular plant part. Um, but botanically speaking, tomatoes are fruits, and specifically, they're a berry. So do tomatoes go in fruit salad? Uh, they could, but I don't know if you would like the flavor. <laughs> so here we've got, here's another one. Here's this cherry tomato. Notice we've got the one locule, two locules right there versus the hybrid tomato has, now maybe there probably were two locules at one point, maybe one side, one side here, um, but it's it's really hard to tell because they're just, they're kind of what, uh, kind of a horticultural monstrosity, which is, uh, or atrocity, depending on how you think about it. But the good thing about these is most horticultural monstrosities are just, for people to look at. These are actually things that we can eat. All right, so if you like this kind of thing, kind of a combination of a little bit of botany about our vegetables and things that we eat, eat and grow every day, you know, follow me, like and subscribe. You'll get to see more.